Hi, in this video I'll be testing out the OM1's ISO performance when photographing birds in conditions when the lighting is dull and far from ideal. In this video I'm in Norfolk and I'm at David Tipling's Woodland Hyde and I've come up here to photograph birds, but primarily I've been photographing sparrowhawks and I've had a great day as far as sparrowhawks. I've had one come down on three occasions but there's been lots of birds here and it's a great setup and I'll show you the hide uh, and the actual setup. The problem I'm having today is not the fact that the birds haven't been cooperating, it's just the lighting. It's been very, very dull and overcast today, so really I've had to push the ISO up to ridiculous amounts. Normally speaking, I'll shoot with the OM-1 at ISO 1600, but today I've been shooting at 3200, 6400, 8000 and even up to 12800. People will say that as far as Olympus Micro Four Thirds cameras, you can't push the ISO, but certainly I've had to today because otherwise I just would not have got a fast enough shutter speed to get a decent image. So when I get the pictures back onto the actual computer, I'll see, we'll be able to compare the difference between the ones I normally shoot at 1600 and how usable the ones at 12,800 are pretty sure that they're going to be okay. So the lens that I've been using today is the 150 to 400 and in this setup that's the ideal length because I can photograph the small birds when they're up here coming down to the seed and the nuts but also if they come here closer I can still get them in and, and the sparrowhawk is coming over there what's happening is that David had actually put out uh, a roadkill pigeon and um, they're coming it's been down three times and when it comes down it stays for about 10 minutes each time so it gives me plenty of opportunity to shoot some nice stills but also do some slow motion video so I'll show you those and see what you think so the sparrowhawk's just been down for a second visit it was an hour, an hour, about an hour between the first time it came down and the second time it came down. It was on the actual pigeon for something like 10 minutes or more. And while it was there, I could hear a buzzard calling, that mirroring sound that buzzards do. And it obviously upset the sparrow a little bit because you could see that it crouched down, it sort of tensed and was looking up to see where it actually was the buzzard. I did wonder whether or not it would come down and they might be a bit of bit of an interaction between them but didn't. But the buzzard is still about and I know that buzzards do come down here. I've photographed them here before. But certainly once the sparrow hawks down all the small birds scatter and you just don't see them at all. About a year ago I put up a YouTube video where I actually showed the existing Heidi had. That's actually been taken down and it's actually got a new setup. Um, so I've come up here today to photograph the Sparrowhawk and within about quarter an hour, 20 minutes of me being here, the Sparrowhawk's down. It's coming down for a dead pigeon, that uh, roadkill pigeon that David had put out there and it's having a really good feed. I can see it there quite easily. Got some nice videos, some nice stills of it. The light's a bit dull today, unfortunately. It's been quite overcast, so I'm struggling to get a fast enough shutter speed, but for video that doesn't matter. So one of the reasons, although I've been to this location before, one of the reasons that I came here is I wanted to see what reflection Paul David's got because he'd I'd seen on the internet on his newsletter that he'd actually got a, a set up a reflection pool in front of this new hide. So uh, I come up here partly to actually get any ideas to see how he'd done it compared to mine. I've not really been happy with my setup. So obviously this is to get some good pictures as well, sparrow hawks and things, but also try and get some ideas on how he's actually set up. He's different from mine and his looks a lot more natural than mine does. Um, it's a bit deeper, a bit bigger, 
but the bank, the edges around it look very, very nice indeed. So I met David this morning at nine o'clock and came down there and he's put a, this dead pigeon out. He's put some seed and, and, and things out for the small birds. And hopefully I might get some small birds coming down. But this sparrowhawk has been actually there for about 10 minutes. I mean, I've you know, got some really nice pictures. So I can talk quite happily to camera because it seems to be pretty bomb proof, to be honest. Um, it can't see me. Um, what we've got actually is a big sheet of glass there, which is two way glass. It's, I think it's made, it's called Stropsil glass and it's not cheap it's very expensive but the quality you get through it is amazing i mean there'd be no difference between me taking the pictures outside and actually through this glass optically the glass is fantastic so um i think you lose a a little bit of light but not much but um i think you'll see with the quality of the pictures that uh, there's no degrading at all so i'm using the om1 and the 150 to 400 and I'm shooting at ISO 2500 because really and truly to get a 500 for a second, 600 for a second, something like that that's what I've got been doing. Light is actually improving slightly but uh, it's a great setup and um, we'll see what we get. When the Sparrowhawk first comes down it will often land on a branch that David has set up at the back of the table from this position, it will sit there for a short while before deciding whether it's safe to fly down. This sequence, where the sparrowhawk flies from the branch onto the table, was shot in slow motion at 240 frames per second. Normally speaking, the sparrowhawk will spend a good few minutes feeding. David will peg the roadkill to the table so that the sparrowhawk cannot fly away with the pigeon. It has to eat it there. Because of this, it will spend a good few minutes plucking the pigeon before then eating the meat. Because the sparrowhawk is not moving too much, shooting wide open at f4.5 and ISO 2500 gave me shutter speeds between 500 and 640th of a second. Even at ISO 2500, there is virtually no noise as these images show. This allowed me plenty of time to shoot stills in both landscape and portrait format. I decided that I wanted to go in for a tighter crop to show the beak pulling the pigeon's flesh. For this, I would need to engage the 1.25 extender, and I also need to use a faster shutter speed to stop any movement. This meant increasing the ISO, so I increased it to ISO 10,000. This produced more noise, but once I'd put the image through Topaz Denoise AI, the noise virtually disappears. In these two side-by-side -side images, you can see the difference between the shot on the left that was before Topaz Denoise and the one on the right after Topaz Denoise. Topaz really is a fantastic piece of software and means you can shoot at ridiculously high ISOs. So now I'm going to show some of the stills that I took of some of the other birds coming in. I found that for the small birds and to avoid subject movement, I had to use a faster shutter speed. So I was left with no alternative but to increase the ISO to 3200, 4000, 6,400 and even up as high as 12,800. Up to ISO 3200 I find noise reduction is not necessary but above this setting I would then start to put the images through Topaz. My processing is to use Lightroom for my initial raw conversion and then import into Photoshop to crop and make other minor adjustments. If I then feel the image will be improved with noise reduction, I will run it through Topaz Denoise. You can use DxO or other noise reduction software, but Topaz is the one that I favour. 
This shot of the great spotted woodpecker was shot quite late in the afternoon and by this time the light really was going so this image was shot at 12,800 ISO. Although the quality is not wonderful it's still usable once you put the image through topaz denoise. I show here the comparison between nose no noise reduction and topaz noise reduction. As you can see with the image on the left the noise is a lot more evident particularly in the dark areas of the background. In the image on the right the noise has disappeared completely. So in conclusion in dull light I'm quite happy to use the OM1 up to ISO 6400. Above that noise does become an issue but with careful post processing it will still produce good results. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it helpful. If you did, please give it a like and subscribe to be notified of future uploads. Thanks for watching.